working up. Okay. Uh, I just got a little recording in progress message. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you want so to start over, that would be good. Pollen lab at NEU. Uh, our main focus there was paleoecological reconstruction. So we were looking at lake cores, sediment cores from bogs, and working up the uh, stratigraphic pollen profiles and and seeing how environments have changed through time. Uh, at at some point, I became in. Um, transition to becoming solely doing archaeobotany, looking at pollen samples from archaeological sites. But I've always had a deep love for plants and botany. And um, gosh, that started a long time ago. So it was, you know, this uh, career has combined a lot of my interests. Um, I'm going to start this PowerPoint. And I'm intending to take over the whole screen. Can you all see that? Have you done it yet? Well, it's on my screen. Is it on yours? Uh, have you done the share screen? Yeah, I thought I just did it. Uh, maybe, I wonder if I have to, uh, let's see, let's end show. I think maybe what I have to do is open it from a different, Okay, share screen and um, so. And if you have your that screen already up, it should you should just be able to click on that and it'll share. So can you see it? Is it working? No, no, no. <laughs> This happened to me once before, and it was so frustrating. Um, OK, let me minimize you guys, start this, and minimize it, and go back to Zoom, go back to Zoom. Uh, did I just drop out of the meeting? No. Huh? Because I don't have my um, I don't have my Zoom screen. Yeah, you'll you'll lose the um, the people. Yeah, but I don't ha even have the um, the menu bar at the bottom. Uh. I'm gonna I'm gonna make you the host, which means I will not be the host, and maybe that'll make a difference. Ooh. It may I don't I, uh, I'm not sure if that. Let's see, Susan Holiday. Susan Holiday is host now. Um, Ugh, okay. I know. Um, Susie, this is Susan Holiday. Yeah. Sometimes when you do that too. If you go onto share screen, you have a whole bunch of little squares. Like sometimes it'll pull up weird things on your computer. You have to find the correct one to share. I don't know. Yeah, if that, uh, that might have happened, but I can't get back to the Zoom menu. Do I have to sign? I can't sign in. Uh, it's giving me a join a meeting, sign in, but I can't even join the meeting. Uh, but I see your thing. And we can see oh, you. There it is. OK. Dang it. OK. So share screen. Oh, there it is. OK, share that. There we go. Got it now? Yep, it's starting. OK, I'm going to. There it is. Start it. There. I'm going to do this as a slideshow. OK. OK. Participants can see the application. Great. Okay, um, I'm going to start this just by acknowledging my uh, Karen Adams, who's a good friend, a colleague, and a mentor. Um, and Karen is an amazing researcher. Her specialty is macrobotanical materials. She's written extensively. She's very articulate. Um, and one of the things that she has always written about in a very thoughtful way is the pitfalls of doing our archaeobotanical research. So one memorable quote from her is, 
the archaeological looking glass is fogged and the images we peer at seem blurry. Plant remains and animal bones in archaeological sites are broken, burned, and deteriorated. Okay. So all of this is to say that archaeobotanical record is based on imprecise science. Um, two, and just two of the topics under that thought is what kind of site are you doing research on? Is it a campsite? Is it Chaco? And uh, what has the history of that site? Is it an ATV playground? Or is it a rock shelter that hasn't been disturbed for millennia? And then just inherent in um, botanical materials coming out of archaeological sites is there is a preservation bias. So for macrobotanical and pollen, um, root and tuber crops are essentially invisible. And, and for pollen, the root and tubers are so far away from the flowers, for one thing. And when people harvest those crops, they're just taking uh, the roots. And so you just, there's just no chance to get pollen into uh, a sample like that. So archaeobotany, there are several specialties or disciplines, uh, macrobotanical, those are the bits, seeds and charcoal. Textiles is almost a subspecialty. There's people who just do fibers. My thing is pollen, but there are other microfossils, uh, phytolus, starches, and more recently, people are starting to look at things that come through on microscope slides that are not pollen, but they're preserving. And these are spores and algae and uh, like worm, worm egg cases. And then more recently, uh, archaeologists are starting to use chemistry and plant genetics uh, to investigate archaeological sites. So archaeopollen, how does it actually work? Um, archaeologists are excavating sites. They come down on a inside a structure on a house floor. They might take a, a dirt sample from that floor or a roasting pit, take a, take a sample of the charcoal and the mixed sediment. And then that's the pollen sample. It has to be sent to an analytical chemical lab where the sediments are um, treated with chemicals to uh, dissolve certain components and then concentrate uh, the pollen out of those samples. And what we get then is this uh, small vial of an extracted residue. Um, assemblages from these processed samples are then put on a microscope and uh, the pollen assemblage is identified. So now just looking within this, um, these specialties, we're just going to focus on pollen. And um, the sediment samples that we get back from the lab and then identify the pollen assemblages on them, they're composed then of a multivariate assemblage. And it's derived, those pollen grains are derived from multiple unknown sources and transported and deposited by unknown vectors. So even in the most protected archaeological context, the pollen spectra are being formed uh, by a mix of environmental and cultural processes. So to begin to unravel any kind of cultural signal in this mess, um, you really need, you need to develop an understanding of the landscape around the site. Uh, and that includes the ecosystems and the vegetation communities, the geology, the soils, and the archaeology. But pollination ecology, the next couple slides I'm going to, uh, or in this talk, I'm going to focus on three topics, pollination ecology, ethnobotany, and then we'll look at some archaeological examples. And pollination ecology is one of those disciplines that it's absolutely key to understanding uh, the importance of the pollen types that get recovered. And in this interpretation phase of pollen analysis, um, the recovered types then are sorted and classified by their pollination system. So I'm going to introduce this idea of pollination ecology. But and you all are probably familiar with a lot of the um, fantastic adaptions in flowers. But this is going to be from the pollen grain perspective. There are two main 
pollination systems uh, in the plant world, insect or entomology and wind or anemophily. And um, the, the wind pollinated syndrome is almost all, well, not almost all of the conifers and all of the grasses are wind pollinated. Uh, and there are also some shrub species like birch and alder. In the insect pollination world, this is um, the cacti, a lot of herbs, uh, the rose family, which includes many of the fruit trees and berries, and most cultigens, except corn, which is grass. So flowers, it's, it's good to review this little flower structure idea. The pollen is produced by the anthers and transported to another flower of the same species. And then the flower, the pollen uh, is, makes its way to the stigma and down the, uh, usually down the uh, style and pollinates the ovules. But how this pollen is transmitted from this one flower's anthers to the next flower's stigma, it's gotta be one of the most fascinating topics in um, biology and, uh, and um, plant flower evolution, plant flower uh, ecosystems. Insect pollinated plants have evolved intimate relationships with their pollinators, all designed to transport pollen from flower to flower. The flowers themselves produce attractants, and this can be color, shape, scents, and a, uh, a lot of these are outside the um, spectrum of human senses. Plants also use food rewards to attract insects, for example, nectars, and pollen grains themselves are food. Insect pollination has evolved a really fantastic array of adaptions and dynamic interactions between the different pollinators and then the architecture and chemistry of the different plant species. And nested within all of these is the morphology of the pollen grains. Just for a bizarre example, uh, here's a carrion flower. It's the world's supposed to be the world's largest flower. It has this um, spadix, which is an inflorescence of uh, reduced male and female flowers all packed into this stalk, and then a, a spathe, which is a big bract that resembles flower petals. So the spadix has a mechanism by which it heats up, and in that it then wafts out the strong odor of decaying meat, and that attracts its pollinators, which are carrying eating beetles and flies. The next uh, slide is of different types of pollen grains, mostly from insect pollinated plants. Um, and it just, this is just to show that these pollen grains are coming in a great variety of sizes and shapes. Um, and the building blocks of these designs have structural animal elements like spines or, um, and also uh, just the um, patterns on the grains themselves are part of these structural elements unique to each species or uh, some each plant species. The other important building blocks in these grains is what we call the aperture systems. And there's two main types. There's slits, which are called colpi, and there are pores. This is a grain with three pores. Um, and there's also, besides the slits and pores, some grains will have aperture systems um, composed of thinned areas. Uh, this is a prickly pear grain, and these this sculpture pattern has is a lacuna with this filly fenestrate uh, border around these uh, areas that are just thin. So that's the aperture system. 
The apertures are important because that's where the living cytoplasm in the pollen grain that contain, contains the genetic material, that's where it's released and expelled. Uh, living pollen grains, live pollen grains, are coated with proteins and other compounds called pollen kit. And uh, this is the pollen kit, this coating is part of that conversation uh, to first attract pollinators and then after getting transported to the right flower, the chemistry of the pollen kit, kit it's, like a, it's like a key in a lock. It initiates the chemical cascade in the stigma to accept the pollen grains uh, cellular matrix and to fertilize the ovules. So what we actually see in this slide are the pollen skeletons. That living coat is gone. The interior um, cellular cytoplasm is gone because these have been chemically processed even as modern reference material. So um, these pollen houses uh, are extremely resistant to deterioration and degradation. They preserve uh, for millennia, uh, hundreds of millennia in soils and in lake sediments because of the composition of the grain walls is this really ancient compound called sporopollenin. And it's just resistant to everything except oxidation. Oxidation will take it out. And um, an example of that are cycles of wetting and drying in soils and other uh, kinds of contexts. Although there are uh, pollen eating bacteria in the soils. So let me name these for you. Uh, this is a cotton grain, big, it's a big grain. The, the sizes are somewhat relative on this slide to show you, again, just that variety in uh, the presentation of pollen grains. So here's an example of big pines. This corner, sorry, this one up in the corner and these down here are also covered with spines, but they're much smaller. And notice that they also have the slits. There's a slit there and a slit there, a culpi. Um, these are just sort of a generic category called, that we just put it in the sunflower family. This compound grain down below, it's actually a clump of individual grains that break apart on, on uh, contact with the uh, female re receptacle. And then there's a thin area that opens up to release cytoplasm. This is acacia. This grain here is rus. These little bow ties are bor borage family. Um, this grain and this grain are periporate, so they're just covered in pores. That's their aperture system. These are chenopodiums. This grain, uh, let's see, I don't, do you guys see the pointer when I point at stuff? Yes. Okay. This grain has multiple slits. This is uh, milkwort or polygala. Um, so it's kind of a, it's pretty kind of a fancy grain. This grain is linum uh, flax, which is, with its really cool uh, sculpture system. On the pointer, this, if you can keep the pointer in place a little longer, it would be easier to see it. Thanks. Okay. See, that's what happens, though. That's what I thought. It goes away automatically, but I'll, I'll keep trying to refresh. This grain is a birch. Um, this is a rose. This is a prickly pear. I think I mentioned that. Uh, it's a bee weed. I don't, I, you guys have something covering my slides. So I, I, I think you see the whole slide, but this one down in this bat, bottom corner is from the pink family and evening primrose right here. So again, um, uh, oh, just a comment about pollen taxonomy. So we use these ap aperture systems and these structural elements to categorize and identify uh, pollen grains. But the taxonomy is fairly coarse, even after, gosh, um, there's probably mm, 150 years worth of uh, people studying pollen grains and working on taxonomy. But as you know, the plant world is a giant world. And so uh, pollen taxonomy remains relatively coarse. We can usually put things in a plant family uh, there, a lot of plant families have very conservative uh, characteristics of their pollen grains. Um, often we can get to genus, 
and occasionally <laughs> we can get to a uh, species. So again, what I wanted to emphasize with this slide, touching back to this idea of pollination ecology, is the variety of the different grains. And these structures, these aperture systems, they've all evolved with specific pollinators and flower morphology. So the whole is sort of combined into this complicated conversation to deliver the right pollen grain to the right female flowers. Uh, Moving a little faster now, just a couple examples. Oh, that went backwards. This is beeweed. This is what its pollen looks like. It has a three uh, culpi system each, and in the center of each culpi is a pore. It's a relatively small grain. Here's agave. It's a much larger grain. The size of this grain would be 0 0.07, seven hundredths of a millimeter. Uh, 70 microns, and this is about as big as they get. Um, there are some grains that approach one tenth of a millimeter. Um, agave is a, it has a, a fancy reticulated net pattern on its, the grain exterior. It's a big grain, but it, the aperture system is one lengthwise thinned area that splits on uh, contact with uh, female parts. Evening primrose, another big grain, um, and it has these uh, three vestibulums. So these are open and insects actually go into these chambers and kind of root around and then they come out. This thing on this slide is not a flaw, it's actually a hair a viscid, a sticky hair. So when the insect exits the pollen grain, it's got everything sort of all wiggly and this hair uh, activates and lassos the insect for a ride to the next slide, next flower. Um, there are, while insect pollination is the main system, there are, there's a small number of species that have evolved in relationships with animals. And long-nosed and long-tongued long bats of northern Mexico and southern Arizona specialize on the nectar of columnar cacti. So that's the reward here. Um, so these bats use their elongated muzzles to get deep down into the flower, get, they get coated with pollen, and then they fly to the next flower and pollen drops into the next flower. The lesser long-nosed bats actually have brush-tipped tongues that go deep into the flower, collect nectar and pollen on the way to their next, next flower. I love this next one. The orchids are just pretty wild in general. Um, they're specialists at insect pollination. The, and the pollen generally clumps together in what's called, is called pollinia. Uh, and, and it's kind of glued together with this waxy material that's attached to filaments. And again, it's another ex example of lassoing the insects uh, for a ride to the next flower. But this particular species native to Spain, Portugal, and Iran is an example of mimicry. Uh, the flowers look like female hemopterus, which attracts males who come to mate with the flower. And then the pollen sticks to the suitor and is carried off to the next flower. Datura. Datura has kind of a fancy grain. It has uh, three culpies. This is, so pollen grains are three-dimensional uh, on the microscope slide. So here, this view is looking at the equator and this view is looking from the top down. So this is a polar view. So you can see the three slits, the three culpi, but what you can't see is that in the middle of each culpi, there's also a pore. Um, so Datura, uh, it was a really important plant to prehistoric cultures in the Southwest. Um, and that's based on uh, images and icons found on artifacts throughout the Southwest. This is a Datura pod, and this is a seed pod that's found not, it's, it's somewhat rare, but it's, it's not, it's, it's found enough to suggest that there's something about this, and they think the archaeologists attribute this 
as a um, icon of the Datura seed pod. Here's another uh, pot. This is a pottery design that looks like that uh, classic unfurling of the Datura flower. Um, they believe that prehistoric people were using it as a hallucinogen. It's actually proved good evidence of that, including some fabulous, uh, a fabulous rock art uh, site or in uh, California. Um, but the plant itself has a lot of medicinal uses, um, not recommended for internal problems, but it's well known as a, a topical and an analgesic pain reliever. And also um, the smoke has been used to treat uh, asthma attacks. Okay, so again, just emphasizing this variety in pollen grains, that's all part of this pollination um, com uh, com conversation. And we really don't understand this conversation, but uh, I'm, I'm hoping to, by showing you this variety and, the, and how uh, unique it can all be that there's definitely something going on. Okay, the next slide, um, I, this has all been about insect pollination, but the other system, um, it's much simpler, is wind pollination. And these are uh, images of uh, male conifer cones releasing their pollen. This is a juniper tree with a big pollen cloud going on. And it can actually almost develop into a pollen storm. And the strategy here is to produce tons of pollen. Here's what some of the two of the most common Southwest wind pollinated types look like. These are pine grains. This is actually a fir and aves grain. So you have this body, and then you have these two sort of Mickey Mouse ears on the side. These are actually air bladders to help the uh, pollen float in the winds. And the pollination system, or uh, what happens on pollination, is the belly of the grain down here, there's just a weak, thin area. And when it lands on the right part, this area splits. Juniper grains, they're when they're fresh, they're round. Um, so this is what they look like when they split. So what does all of this mean? How you uh, employ this to interpret archeological assemblages? Um, and really the big uh, take home message here is that insect pollinated types are generally underrepresented in the natural pollen rain. They're underrepresented then in modern surface samples and um, in a natural system, but the wind pollinated types are overrepresented in the natural pollen rain. So um, Again, the wind pollinated types, they're just producing tons of pollen. One pine tree can produce greater than a billion of pollen grains, and it, it floats in the air across vast distances. So in interpreting this type, this, um, these two syndromes, filtering the pollen types we see on the assemblages through this uh, pollination ecology lens, the you can get like one or two pine grains in a soil sample from an arc site and it's meaningless. You can get one pollen grain from an insect pollinated type and it could be incredibly important. It could be a landslide of pollen. So this is sort of the general guidelines, but the devil is always in the details. And this is an example of a devilish detail. This is globe mallow. Um, this is what the pollen grain looks like. It's spiny. It has an uh, aperture system of pores. It has a specialized pollinator um, that is a, it's this, it's called the globe mallow bee. It's super tiny. It's like seven to nine milliliter, millimeters long. And uh, it has, the female bees are equipped with specialized plumose hairs to gather the large uh, globe mallow pollen grains and they have them uh, then they store them in that's what you're seeing here is the back end of a globe mallow bee with a load of globe mallow pollen 
uh, on its on its hairs. So they take this pollen back to their nest. Their nests are subterranean, and they mix the pollen grains with um, let's see uh, nectar. So they're probably get so they're gathering nectar from the flowers too. They mix the pollen grains with nectar, and they make these individual little loaves. They park one loaf in each um, uh, offspring cell for a food source for when it hatches. But from the pollen perspectives, as a person who's trying to interpret uh, pollen assemblages, if I get a huge spike of globe mallow pollen in a sediment sample from, even from an arc site, you have to consider that that could be insect caching because of the way of the biology of this bee and that it has underground nests. So again, that the devil, it's nuanced and that devil's in the details. If you don't know anything about globe mallow bees, uh, you could miss it. All right. So now we're gonna move on just a little bit to uh, one of the foundations of uh, archaeopollen studies. And well, arche all archaeobotany leans heavily on ethnobotany. Uh, this is what we use to uh, recognize plant use uh, it, or can use it to recognize plant use. And I'm gonna start here with um, uh, Richard Schultes, uh, often attributed as the father of ethnobotany. He was a Harvard uh, botany professor whose passion became understanding ritual and ceremonial plant use, especially hallucinogens. And I love this photograph. This is Schultes on the left. Uh, he's 21 years old. He's, he's out with uh, a, another grad friend, grad student friend from Yale. And they have just spent all night with this Kiowa medicine man uh, in a peyote ritual. And here's Schultes, he's this buttoned up, you know, Yale guy, got his tie on after a full night of peyote. Um, he was an amazing researcher. And from the 1940s to the 1950s, Schultes traveled throughout the Amazon, uh, collecting some 20,000 botanical specimens and docu documenting the knowledge of native shamans. He just dived deep into those cultures. He lived with those people, uh, you know, and I really recommend this book if you haven't read it, One River by Wade Davis. Wade was a grad student of Schultes and One River is the, basically the biography of his Amazonian research. All right, so I wanna kind of talk about ethnography. Ethnobotany comes from ethnographic accounts collected by interviewers and uh, people and archived in written down uh, documents of one sort of or another. It really truly is uh, an incredibly valuable resource. Um, it's the source of ethnobotanical knowledge. And again, sort of the simplistic superficial model in archaeobotanical studies is to read these ethnographic historic histories and then match recovered plant parts to uh, the accounts in the ethnobotanical record. There's a couple problems with this. Uh, at the, a lot of the mm, critical ethnographic studies were done at the end of the 1800s and into the early 1900s. Um, and it became sort of a fad for people to go live with the Indians and uh, record their lifestyles and their uh, technologies, what they did. Um, and so the problem with historic interviews is that there is always researcher bias because what gets written down is filtered through the scientist experience. The other problem with ethnographic studies is that even by the late 1800s, uh, when a lot of these studies were being documented, the traditional life ways were already diluted and altered by imported foods and ideas. And also native people had been so abused by white cultures that they were distrustful to share their knowledge. Um, Schultes is an example of somebody who really connected in a deep way and uh, with, with um, ethnographic uh, research. So I really wanna emphasize 
that our modern perspective, we absolutely underestimate by a large margin the prehistoric people's intimate connection to their landscapes and the knowledge of where and when to find specific resources. Another really well done uh, ethnography is uh, Amadeo Reyes at the Desert's Green Edge, Ethnobotany of the Gila River uh, Pima. And this is, again, even though it's more recent, he was doing this in the 1970s through the 90s, but he spent more than 20 years establishing trust and relationships with Heleno uh, Gila River Pima elders. And he listened to their stories and wrote down their words. And um, as much as, I mean, I'm sure there's gotta be some bias in there, but he was really sensitive to that. So this is another just like really super excellent book. And again, I will just say, uh, even in these elders are probably are well, uh, David's gone, Ruth is maybe gone. Uh, we're just seeing the last vestiges of ethnobotanical knowledge. But I'm gonna take a quick side trip now into uh, this, something that I'm very excited about. I think ethnobotany is alive. And it's it's today. It's happening. It's 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 morphing and evolving. And I just um, so this picture on the side, and just um, I don't know what the word is. I'm in awe. This is a picture. There's a there's a whole group of people who are passionate about making sculptures out of flower parts. So this little guy, his ears are flower petals. And then all of the hairs and whiskers are flower anthers and fiddly bits out of flowers. These are feathery stamens in the ear, ear hairs. So um, this is ethnobotany. Um, in our modern cuisines, um, and the, Gather Victoria is a website. I was going to try to do a recipe from them, but they just are, she's just incredibly uh, creative about using um, plants in amazing uh, food food recipes. Today we have mixologists, right? People making alcoholic and non-alcoholic drinks using a combination. Their their palate is global, uh, so they're just using this amazing combinations. Um, you can get ashwagandha in your lattes. Uh, Drylands Perfume. I should I I could bring out the website for, for these guys, uh, perhaps later send it on as a link. They're making perfumes and uh, uh, facial products really high quality out of weeds. They're using tamarisk, they're using tumbleweed. Uh, uh, and it's, I just, they're just really creative and their, their products are uh, top notch. And then herbal medicine, I'll just touch on this. This is, again, just evolving like crazy uh, and people getting uh, more and more into this. If you know anything about Stephen, Stephen Booner, uh, he's another amazing uh, and prolific and articulate writer of herbal. Uh, he's written books on herbal uh, antivirals and herbal antibacterias. He has a book on Lyme disease, all with um, native native medicines. Okay, that was just a little break. Um, the next topic then is archaeology. And uh, I'm going to show you some examples. of uh, using uh, some archaeobotany in archaeology. But first, just, a, just to, we all know this because we live in the Southwest, we're surrounded by archaeology, but uh, I'm going to go over it a little bit anyway. There is a visible record that dates back to almost 12,000 years ago. These people in that time frame were probably nomadic um, hunters mostly, but I'm sure they were also gathering a lot of plants. And then we have 
basically a continuous record from 12,000 years ago to about AD 1200, when you have the great abandonment in the Southwest. By AD 500, you have uh, big villages. There's pottery, there's art, there's musical instruments, there's ceremony, there's ritual, uh, an extensive trade network. Uh, of will along, especially with the Western Pacific coast down through the Gulf of California, but also some of the highest quality obsidian and turquoise come from mines in Arizona and New Mexico. And these materials are found throughout the Southwest and also into the Southern uh, US and the Eastern US. All of the subsistence and material resources to build the infrastructure and feed these people came from their landscapes. They didn't have grocery stores um, and, or cell phones, so, but they were just so intimately connected with the plants and animals and environments that inhabited uh, their world. And of course, the Southwest, our, our archeology span is so amazing because they were agriculturalists and it, was, it gave them an economic base to build these huge villages. And um, this is just a model of the spread of, ma of, spread of maize from Mesoamerica, from Mexico into the Southwest. And in the, the archeological record, the oldest remains that we know of have been dated to a little bit over 4,000 years ago, but it's probably older than that. So in this slide, again, this is a model of how this um, spread. The darkest colors are the oldest, and then it just got bigger and bigger. All right, so next we're gonna look at a few examples of where pollen has contributed something to the archaeobotanical record. Um, and within the world of arche archaeobotany, I have a subspecialty within looking at old agricultural systems. Um, and that is all to uh, try to play detective and find out what plants uh, people were growing. This is a summary of a project, a long running project in New Mexico. Uh, I and a, a team of people from the Bureau of Indian Affairs and um, some subcontractors, we all worked together for more than 20 years. And it was sponsored by the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Albuquerque to help uh, Rio Grande Pueblos establish um, claims to Rio Grande water based on an ancient history of agriculture. And so I'm not sure how clear this map is, but it's really looking at the Northern Rio Grande. Here's Española. And then this is this valley up here is the Ojo Caliente. And what, we're, what our focus became was the technology of gravel mulch fields. And on this map slide, the gray patches are mapped remnants of Pleistocene river gravels that occur on both sides of the ter on terraces on both sides of the Rio Grande River. The squares and circles and triangles on this map are just um, locating sites where there's actually been some studies. Not all of those are studies that my group got involved in. But uh, we, again, over 20 years, we accumulated quite a bit of, of research. And what we would do is go out to these old field systems. So this is an example of a gravel mulch field. And um, it doesn't look like much, but uh, this is what people were farming in. And what we found and was that they were using the gravel mulch to grow cotton. It was a high value crop. It was important to prehistoric peoples. They figured out how to grow it. Northern Rio Grande is outside the range of this subtropical crop. And so again, this technology to use these gravel mulches to uh, as both thermal and water conservation systems to grow cotton is pretty brilliant. They also manage just about every drop of surface water out there. This is an example of a check dam. And this is a, this is a picture of a cotton pollen grain, if you didn't get that. Um, 
Cotton was the specialty in these gravel mulch fields, but there was agriculture, of course, all up and down the Rio Grande Valley. And so people were also growing, but, but again, the, 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 um, the gravel mulches were a specialty and cotton is about the only pollen type that would be recovered from these fields. There are, this is another example of a different kind of farming system. This is a rock grid system. Uh, and here in this slide at the bottom is trying to sort of depict how these grid fields might have worked where you have water coming down a, a fan or a draining, in this case, a drainage. And there, in this particular case, this was near Cochiti, uh, New Mexico. There was, pro there was an intake um, dam to channel water so that it flowed through real low tech ditches through these grid systems. And in these fields, uh, what we recovered was corn. So these were more of uh, a corn-based uh, field system. And then I think this is about my last slide on field systems. Um, this is the Salt River. This is the Phoenix Basin, AD 1100. All the lines on this map are canals. All the polygons, the gray polygons, are um, village uh, concentrations um, with their suburbs of field houses and uh, smaller structures. The Phoenix Airport, I believe it's about right in here somewhere. Let's see. And again, this map is just to emphasize the scale of landscape modification throughout the Southwest. Um, this canal system, even though this is AD 1100, this is about the peak of the canal irrigation uh, communities along the Salt River. But this is, but the technology goes back uh, at least to 1500 BC. They have canals that are dated that old in Southern Arizona. Um, this is the Hohokam culture. They were growing uh, in these field systems. They were growing cotton, maize, beans, squash, and agave. And they were managing native plants. And in some cases, breeding cultivars from native plants. Two examples of that are a cult cultivar Kinopodium, Kinopodium cruentus, cruentus, and also little barley grass, Hordium pusillum. Um, and pollen analysis has helped uh, contribute to unraveling some of these stories of extensive native plant use and manip manipulation. Choya is a, a pollen type that is extremely common in Southwest arc sites. And it's, what it's reflecting is a Choya flower bud harvest and processing, which still is a, it's one of the foods one of the native foods that's still harvested by native peoples. And it's also made its way, of course, into modern cuisine. Just a comment about this legacy. Um, uh, it was the archeological imprint, the, the prehistoric people's imprint on our landscapes was huge. They changed plant communities composition with important plants and weeds. They moved native species around. And most of you are probably familiar with Wendy Hodgson's work uh, with agaves, and she's um, documented agave refugias that are way out of the range of natural populations, but they were introduced um, by prehistoric peoples and they've uh, hung on in little refugias. And so um, it always strikes me that I don't hear it as much anymore, but there used to be in restoration ecology, you know, the goal, the ideal was we wanted to go back to the natural uh, pre-Eurasian settlement conditions. But in reality, that's not a valid model because of the scale of landscape modification that was and the time frame, you know, 4,000 years of agriculture in the Southwest. Um, it's not, it's not a, a pre-human condition 
uh, the pre uh, Euro Asian uh, goal. All right, just a couple more slides to emphasize again how sophisticated people were. Got to mention Chaco. Uh, this is Pueblo Benito in fog, had an estimated 800 rooms, five stories high, 40, 40 kivas, and two plazas with great kivas. Tree ring dates, very narrow occupation range, 860 to the 1120s. And among the many unusual objects and artifacts found um, in excavations from Pueblo Benito are these cylinder jars. They're these tall cylinder jars. They're white with black, black design. And um, there's fewer than 200 cylinder jars known from the American Southwest. And 166 of these come from Pueblo Benito, most from one room, room 28. And um, there were some recent excavations of room 28. And this is a book from those excavations. But this picture on the front was taken by Richard Wetherill in 1896, just when room 28 is being open and exposed. And then these are the cylinder jars embedded, the first view embedded um, in the sediment. So they're a great mystery um, what these could have been used for. Obviously, they were special. They were probably ceremonial. Patty Crown, who actually uh, she directed this uh, recent excavation of room 28, she and co-author Jeffrey Hurst sampled the organic residues preserved on sherds excavated from room 28 and they sent them for a mass spectrometry chemical analysis and the results indicated that the vessels had held chocolate and they believed that that was something that was imported from Museo America and this inspired uh, them to then expand the study to examine materials from 18 other Southwest sites and, uh, in, a, a, and in this larger group of, of chemical analyses, they found evidence for chocolate. So it's not just a chocolate thing, but they also found the chemical signature of caffeine, which they believe to be uh, Ilex vomitoria or Yapan, which is um, in its, its range is the Southeast United States. And this is just another plant uh, that they believe was being imported from the Southeast, chocolate from Museo America. Almost my last slide coming up here. Uh, we have to at least mention uh, the magician burial. This is a Flagstaff archaeological site, Ridge Ruin. It's east of Winona. Um, and the burial was found, the excavations were done in the 1930s. John McGregor was the field director for this project. Uh, and they uncovered this burial of an adult male. The site itself is, it's interesting, but it's a small site. It was a small Pueblo room block, 20 to 25 rooms. This is a map of the burial. And they did a bust reconstruction of what he might have looked like. And I love that he has a nose ring and earrings. Um, these artifacts in the burial, here's the list. Uh, 25 whole or reconstructable vessels, eight baskets, 420 arrow points. His skull cap was a beaded, um, beaded skull cap done in a pattern of black stone and white shell beads. There was abalone. There was raw pigments and raw turquoise. And in the fill above the burial were two parrots. It was such a cool site that in the 1930s, they even ponied up for color plates in the article. This is uh, his nose ring. And um, I think these are, I forget what these were. Anyway, the, it's just the quality of these artifacts. Uh, it was exceptional. And some of the material, like the, the wood workmanship, and there are materials on these artifacts that have yet to be uh, identified. 
So again, from our modern perspective, the knowledge, the connection with the landscape of prehistoric peoples, we just can't really connect with how sophisticated that was. The archaeobotanical record from Flagstaff. I did this for, um, I did a little synthetic report of all the arc report, archaeobotanical reports I could find in the region. Um, 49 taxa from dozens of sites, the cultigen list, pumpkin, squash, bottle gourd, tobacco, beans, maize, cotton, and agave. Um, and yes, cotton was grown in Flagstaff. Uh, there are cotton remains from an Elden Pueblo, but it was not uncommon to find cotton remains in sites uh, east of Flag, especially the Winona and uh, parts further east. So 49 taxa, I'm not going to list, I didn't list all the wild plant taxa, but uh, the wild plant taxa often gets ignored or underemphasized because we're just focused on these cultigens, because that's how we can relate to how people made a living. That was the basis of their economy. Um, but um, we, and so we have this little, mm, uh, I guess, uh, opinion that somehow native plants weren't as important as cultigens. But it's really um, in the mindsets partially due to what we recover. So honestly, uh, it's we usually are just looking at very small sites. We're lucky to find any macrobotanical uh, materials at all. And from the pollen perspective, um, it's just the native plants are rare. In, or scarce in archaeological samples. However, um, it is a it's also it's also a fact that sites themselves had short uh, occupation spans and were often fairly small endeavors. Uh, the Ridge Ruin, the Magician site, that would be somewhat of a um, uh, an exception. But I what I want to say is that uh, the native plants that we do see, they're sort of the tip of the iceberg. And again, just shifting your mindset about how to think about that, they could have well supplied gourmet ingredients for traditional cuisines that would be exotic to our taste buds. And um, there are a couple examples of important native plants that I'm sure were key in cuisine. Uh, Blazing Star Manzilia is one. Another one uh, are tansy mustards. And then, of course, uh, you have the sweetness and the juiciness of cacti fruits. Those were prepared a million different ways, roasted, dried, boiled, pureed. Um, cattail is another really important native plant. Um, they actually made cakes from the pollen. Um, and then, of course, choya flower buds. Uh, many of you may have had the opportunity to taste Troy flower buds because that uh, and they're fun to play with. Okay, actually, that is the end. I don't have a sunset picture. <laughs> so I'll have to try to unshare now. How do I do that in show? Right. How do I unshare? You are screen sharing. Stop video, new share. Uh, okay. Anybody help her out? Oh, wait, I'll just shut down. Oh, here we go. There we go. On. Yeah. Great. Um, so, um, do people have questions or comments that you would like to share? See if you have any questions in the I'm going to turn off the recording actually. All right. Okay, so there's a there's a four chat. Oh, the multi-sock. Oh, uh, you know what? You are the host now. And so I can't turn it off. Can you can you go down to where it says record and press the button? Where's where's that? Uh, down at the bottom, right next to the share screen, you'll see record. Does it have a smiley face? I don't think so.